Okay, I think we're going to get going because we've got a pretty full agenda tonight. Um, I'm Wade Zaymour, um, Chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, we've got quite a few members from both the, the CAC and the public. Uh, we'd like to open these meetings with any uh, general comments or questions, but keep them really brief. And then I'm going to turn it over to Ed, and we're going to do the presentations one at a time so that we can have a little Q&A, at least from the, from the um, Citizens Advisory Committee in between. I think it's just too much to wait to the end of all three uh, development team presentations. So, has anybody got a burning question or a comment? Um, come on up, David. I'm Dave Belbeck from Porter Square. I'd like to I remarked that as a homeowner, one of my important issues is the way the residential tax taxes keep going up, and therefore I'm very interested in commercial development here at the right time. And so I intend to uh, listen to these presentations with an open mind. I hope you all will too. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to go. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ed. And uh, he wanted me to let you know that any, any citizens or anybody that has a question that you don't wanna ask in public, um, you can bring uh, written questions up to the table at the front. We've got staff and uh, they'll make sure whether it's during the meeting or after that at some point you get an answer to that, okay? Thank you, Wing. To uh, the members of the CAC, Welcome back. Uh, it's good to see you again. To uh, I, sh I should say, uh, on the table for the members and for the general public, we have uh, we have a number of handouts, uh, most of which we have spoken to, to in the past. But uh, what, I, what we have there is excerpts from the master developer rationale. Uh, when we met last time, we spent a good deal of time. Uh, speaking about uh, why the SRA has decided to adopt the, the master developer approach. That handout is right down here at the table. At the same point in time, there are the assessments and the qualifications that we included within the RFP, pages 52 to 54, that really spoke to the standards of what we were hoping to see in each one of the uh, development responses, and those will be the basis for which uh, the CAC will review the nine responses and will make their recommendation to the SRA. There's also a schedule of developer presentations. Uh, we will be meeting uh, with the CAC and the development teams on three nights. We will be doing three presentations each night. This is the first one of those. The CAC will be meeting uh, on the 11th next week in the same place and we'll meet again the following Tuesday on March the 18th. The Somerville Redevelopment Authority at its meeting last week decided that they would also like to see presentations from each one of the teams. So those will be scheduled for uh, beginning next week. Monday it will be held at Next Monday's meeting will be held in the Aldermanic ch Chambers at City Hall from 4 to 6 p.m. Then on Tuesday, uh, the 11th, it will be held at, at uh, the Public Safety uh, Building. And then the final meeting of the SRA will be held uh, on Thursday the 13th. And that will be held at, in the VNA Building on Wall Street. So it is a busy schedule. Uh, we hope to through this. Uh, in the near future so we can begin to consider the applications uh, and to look to a more developed, more narrow list of finalists. I should also say uh, in terms of announcements for the CAC, as you can see we have made arrangements uh, to have these meetings uh, be available on the Summerville City Cable uh, Network, that is channel 22 on Compact, Comcast, channel 13 on RCN, and channel 15 on the Education. Uh, channel so if a member is not able to attend it they will still be able to see uh, each of the presentations uh, I should also mention and welcome Scott Heyman here who is from the who is from the SEC Shana Corning Houston has left the SEC to go to work for Urban Edge uh, when we were assembling uh, 
the CAC. We thought it was important that there be uh, a representative of the CAC on that. So we are we are happy to welcome Scott. It's his first meeting here uh, this evening. Uh, the last announcement that I made, or rather, the, the, the last announcement that I have, I referred to at the meeting last week, and that is there is a, a request from Team Better Block to meet with us uh, to the week of the 25th. Uh, on your agendas, you will see there is a, a website address that will give you a little bit of, of uh, background as to who they are, but it's absolutely a worthwhile investment, especially when we look at this through the context of the infrastructure improvements and the opportunity to improve on the public spaces in and around Union Square. So what I would like to do is uh, schedule that meeting for the 25th. Uh, it'll be in the, it'll be in the, in this room, hopefully, sometime between 6 and 8, but Amanda will let you all know. But if you could uh, plan on doing that, that'd be great. So with those announcements, with those handouts, uh, for the members of the CAC on the table here, there are also writing pads and pens. We would encourage you to take notes, to, uh, make note of what you like, what you might want to ask a bit more, uh, and we can go from there. But uh, I don't have anything else, and I would like to kick this off by asking Team from uh, Trinity Development and the Davis Square companies doing business as Union Square Associates LLC to come up here and to make their best argument. So. Can everyone hear me out there? Um, okay, thank you guys very much for having us here this evening. Uh, my name is Kenan Digby. I'm a vice president with Trinity Financial. I'm joined here this evening by uh, the key members of my development and design team uh, from the Davis Companies and from Icon Architecture, uh, both of whom you'll hear from uh, in just a short while. Um, before we get started with the presentation, I just want to say that we are uh, very excited to be here. We're very excited about this project. Um, we think that Union Square has a lot going for it and that uh, with the right plan and the right uh, team to implement that plan, uh, this really has the potential to be a national model for urban infill economic development. So we're very excited uh, and we're happy to be starting this process with you all. Um, I think to, to get started, we'll just tell you a little bit about our development team. Um, um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about uh, Trinity Financial. Trinity Financial is a 27-year-old uh, Boston-based real estate development firm. It was started in 1987 by the two principals, Jim Keefe and Patrick Lee. Uh, Jim Keefe is here with us tonight. Both principals are still active uh, in, in the company. Uh, and Jim Keefe will actually be the principal in charge for the Trinity team. I say that a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek. He doesn't actually do any work. That's up to us <laughs> up here. Um, but there is a wealth of uh, knowledge there uh, that, uh, that will be part of uh, what we're proposing to do here. Um, Trinity is, as I said, we've been at it since 1987. We've done over $2 billion uh, of real estate development, built uh, about 9,000 units of housing and over half a million square feet of uh, retail and commercial. Um, we, uh, over the years, have worked in six states and about 60 communities throughout the Northeast. Um, this experience has taught us that um, every community is unique. Every community pre presents its own uh, different challenges and opportunities. And we very much take that to heart when we um, embark on these types of developments. 
Uh, we don't pretend to have all the answers. We don't show up um, assuming that, hey, we've done it this way somewhere else, so we'll just plop that down here uh, and it should work here. Uh, we really realize that each of these developments is different and special. Uh, and the way to arrive at a plan uh, that sort of fits that particular neighborhood uh, is to engage in an open, collaborative, and ongoing engagement process with the community. Um, we do that by meeting with community stakeholders, um, meeting with elected officials, meeting with municipal officials, and coming up with a plan that really reflects uh, the wants and needs and goals and desires of the community in which we're working. Um, so that would be our approach here. Um, that being said, we do feel like we have some skills uh, that we bring to the table uh, that are valuable and that we'd like to employ here. Um, we are adept at putting together complicated financing structures that involve you know, private debt and equity, which is sort of the bread and butter of building these types of things, but also leveraging public resources in many different shapes and forms uh, that allow us to have some flexibility and some creativity in how we approach these, uh, these developments. Um, we're also, um, we think we have uh, the patience uh, and the stick to if I can use that word, uh, to engage in these uh, sometimes complicated, uh, complex regulatory and political processes that are required to get the approvals that we need to move these projects forward. Um, that takes a lot of effort, um, a lot of patience, and we think that uh, our team exhibits those, uh, those qualities. Um, the last thing that I would say about Trinity before turning it over to my uh, team members is that we do focus in um, sort of housing-centric mixed-use development. That's the bulk of our development. It certainly won't be the only component uh, for a redevelopment effort here at Union Square, um, but I think it will be an important component. Um, we, we take an approach that uh, this type of housing uh, can do a number of things. Uh, one, it can uh, maintain neighborhood diversity. Uh, as I said at the beginning, there's a lot going on in Union Square, a lot that's really working. And we want to make sure that what we bring in here sort of builds on what's existing in Union Square. And I think the diversity of its residents and its businesses is a big piece of um, what makes Union Square strong. Uh, so our approach to housing is to develop housing that can serve um, pop a diverse uh, set of populations. We build uh, housing that starts at sort of high-end market rate all the way down to housing for uh, formerly homeless individuals and everything in between. Um, we don't know exactly what the right mix is for this project yet, um, but we have experience with all of it, um, and we do it in a way that those elements come together harmoniously. Um, and then the other piece that I would mention on our, our approach to housing is that the mixed-use component is very important. Um, it allows us to create a retail ban that activates the street um, you'll sort of see that in plan as we move forward, how that can work and what that can do for Union Square. Um, it also allows us to create these retail opportunities that aren't just for um, sort of the national chain anchor uh, tenant. I mean, there's obviously a place for that in putting together the financing, uh, but there's also a place for the independent retailer, um, sort of the retailer that's unique to the area. And so the way we put these deals together allows for us to create those opportunities for independent retailers. And again, we do it in a way that bundles all of these different uses together um, to, to create sort of a backbone for a growing community. Um, so we think that's going to be an important piece, one piece, uh, of what can be successful here at Union Square. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to John Fry from the Davis Companies. He'll tell you a little bit about his firm um, and, and expand a little bit more on our vision for Union Square. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'd just like to say uh, thank you, uh, as Tina did, for having us here. Uh, like Trinity, the Davis Companies uh, has been around for a long time. We were founded by John Davis, who's here in the audience, uh, 37 years ago. So Trinity and the Davis Companies, uh, as firms, have known each other for a while. And we should mention we're actually working together uh, on another project right now uh, down in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, we uh, are here for really two reasons. Uh, one is our focus on commercial real estate, office, bioscience, lab, uh, as the main component, and retail as a mixed-use component with those projects. 
Uh, we currently own and manage uh, approximately 12 million square feet of this type of real estate, commercial real estate, uh, much of which is in the Boston area. We're headquartered in Boston and historically uh, have been uh, investors primarily in this market. Uh, we've also developed as a company from the ground up uh, a little over 3 million square feet of commercial real estate. Uh, we'll talk about one of our projects in a minute. Uh, I'll also mention that about a third of that uh, has been certified lead gold or higher. So a focus on uh, environmental sustainability is, is something that is, uh, is very important uh, to our firm. Uh, the second big reason uh, that we're excited to be involved here is we uh, currently manage a discretionary real estate fund, which is $413 million, and uh, are excited and plan to invest significant capital uh, in this project should we, should we be lucky enough to be, to be the chosen uh, co-developer and the developers here. Um, so with that, I think uh, we want to save some time to talk about our vision and, and some of our historical projects, so I'll turn it over to Nancy to give you an introduction uh, to ICON. wanted to walk you through a few um, sample projects to give you a sense of some of the concepts that we just described. Um, we did provide a handout where there's some additional information on each of these projects um, along with, since I'm in a school, I'm going to call it our report card, sort of reiterating uh, how we score against the uh, rating criteria. Uh, so hopefully all of the CAC has that. If not, I see a few extras up here, and we can certainly get more to folks uh, if you're looking for them. Um, the first project that you're looking at here is one that Nancy just mentioned. Uh, this is in uh, the West End neighborhood of Boston, directly across from the Boston Garden, which you can see off to the right there. Um, this is our Avenir project. It was 
um, built in partnership with MassDOT and the MBTA. It actually sits right on top of the North Station MBTA stop, and you can see from that image, uh, the station is actually accessed right through the base of our building. Um, this is, as I described, um, in our wheelhouse in terms of being a uh, housing-focused mixed-use building. There's 241 units, about 29,000 square feet of street-level retail. Um, this is one of those sort of ultimate TOD projects um, with the T-Station right there. We're able to um, get approved a uh, variance to have our parking ratio all the way down to 0.5. So for those 241 uh, units, there's about 120 parking spaces. Um, we were the first developer to get one of these uh, big dig parcels developed. Um, this parcel, um, as you can see on the site plan there, is a, one of a series of parcels that was um, uh, unearthed, so to speak, when the central artery was buried and with, when the uh, surface uh, train tracks were buried. Um, we had so much fun uh, on Avenir that we came back for seconds and we now have one canal, which is uh, one block uh, away from Avenir, which is currently under construction, uh, a, uh, another housing-focused uh, mixed-use TOD development that is currently under construction. Uh, so we highlighted these two projects just to sort of show you how that type of uh, construction can work. Uh, how we tailored it specifically for the neighborhood in which we built it, and how we embraced the TOD aspects uh, uh, for the development of those projects. Uh, so again, just a, a small sample of uh, some of our work and how we think it's relevant uh, and appropriate for uh, what you guys are discussing here in Union Square. Uh, so the project I'm going to talk about is called Charles River Plaza. It's uh, right next to Mass General Hospital on Cambridge Street. Uh, really uh, one of the gateway roads into Boston. So we acquired this property. Uh, it was a 220,000 square foot building with some very uh, underperforming retail in the ground floor, uh, office on the upper floors. Built in the 1960s, so very bland, uh, uninteresting concrete facade. And uh, our vision for this property uh, was really to create, uh, and we uh, found a tenant associated with MGH Partners Healthcare uh, to take a lot of the leasable square footage in this building. And we were able to take what was a 220,000 square foot building and actually keep the existing bones of the building, but triple the size by developing another 440,000 uh, square feet. Uh, what we uh, have now uh, is this building that you see there, which uh, has a mix of, of office and uh, medical office and lab space in the upper floors. And then uh, we totally uh, reprogrammed the retail uh, that was on the ground floor. We brought in a Whole Foods, a CVS pharmacy, uh, a Bank of America, and some others, uh, and totally uh, also redid uh, the facade, not only of the new building, which was obviously brand new, but we redid the facade of, of the old buildings as well um, to really activate and create a more vibrant, lively streetscape uh, that the community could enjoy. Uh, another interesting thing about this building is it was really at the nexus, it is at the nexus of two neighborhoods, the West End neighborhood and the Beacon Hill neighborhood. So a big part of this for us as we were going through it was to collaborate with those two neighborhoods, understand what they were looking for in this development, and then also work with our tenant partners, healthcare, uh, and the Boston Redevelopment Authority and other city officials uh, to think through the permitting process. Uh, we also actually had to do a land, slop, uh, land swap uh, and negotiate that with the city in order to get access to some of the facade work I just described. So uh, we see this in, in some ways as analogous to, to many of the components of this project where there are numerous constituencies that uh, we need to bring together, understand everybody's interest, and create the best uh, mix of use and the best design uh, and, and the best overall project uh, for all the constituencies involved. Can you all hear me if I just leave this? Um, so I'm going to talk 
talking about a really different kind of project um, done, done with this team. Up in Lowell, it's the 15-acre Hamilton Canal District, and I think it has a lot of synergies with uh, the Union Square uh, redevelopment that's being proposed. Uh, it's a similar size. Uh, it is a lot of bricks and mortar. It's a half a million square feet of commercial space. It is uh, about 55,000 square feet of ground level retail. It is seven to 800 units of housing and a 900 car parking garage and restoration of pedestrian crossings over canals in an old <coughs> mill environment and uh, a whole new utility infrastructure with new bridges and roadways and utilities to make use of this uh, island environment between um, these manufacturing canals that were built um, in the manufacturing era. Um, I think what's important about this project is that uh, this was a year-long community charrette uh, process. Uh, we started out with Saturday long sessions listening to the community, uh, hearing about the issues, finding out what was special and important, uh, coming back, digesting that, throwing out ideas, engaging the residents in smaller groups to actually design components of this plan and come back and represent to the community. Um, and ultimately what we ended up with was a community engaged plan. Um, that was depicted in a very special document called the form-based code, where we actually laid out the criteria for development of the parcels so that with each piece that's developed, um, there's a clear uh, form. Uh, we aren't prescriptive about use because we want to encourage vibrant mix of uses here, um, but it is a document that is approved by the planning board uh, and allows an easy permitting process. Uh, first project built was the Appleton Mills. This was a burned out, bombed out, falling down. I, I'm not afraid to go in many buildings, but I was afraid to go in this one. Uh, and actually our structural engineer about fell through the floor. Anyway, uh, 130 <laughs> units of artists that were housing uh, in some very unique configurations. Um, some live cell spaces that I'll show you in a minute. But importantly, um, this is on the central island. It is the community core. It is a critical mass. And we've created this courtyard uh, that is both a place for the artists to engage and have um, outdoor artwork and festivals. Um, and it is all also targeted as a venue for the Lowell's Folk Fest. It has uh, stripes, uh, bands of pavement that go through that reflect the lines of uh, transport for the manufacturing. It, there is a linear fountain that marks the length of the hydropower pen stock below ground. Um, and it is a um, engaging environment. Next slide. Um, where we work very hard to preserve <coughs> the historic elements of the building itself, uh, despite wood that was rotted and needed to be replaced, we painstakingly deconstructed the building, rebuilt it with the original cast iron columns. Um, upper uh, photograph, you see that we've now reopened kind of these, these archways below buildings and restored uh, pedestrian crossings across the water. Uh, right here, you see a ghosted structure of the um, all these mills were interconnected by passageways up high, and we've left the ghosted frame to mark that history. Uh, we've interpreted in a contemporary fashion the hoistways uh, that were on these buildings to lift the product up and out, and they've now become decks. Uh, and we've engaged the pedestrian realm with these live cell spaces, big roll-up doors, so that the artist who has that unit can actually push out into, uh, onto what is an interpreted uh, and uh, just finished a 60,000 square foot um, office building uh, in the former Freudenberg uh, Woolens Manufacturing Building. Huge concrete floor plates, uh, big uh, open spaces, uh, restored windows that create sort of amazing looks beyond the canal. Uh, but I also wanted to point out, I've shown some of the bricks and mortars, but I think We've achieved other successes. We've got infrastructure money into the project to do a lot of utility and roadway work, building bridges. 
We've got money in support of studying and extension of the historic trolley system in Lowell that will now connect to the Gallagher Terminal, which is the commuter rail station a quarter mile away. And we just heard news last month about a funded study for extending Jackson Street to connect the West End back into the downtown. Next. So, uh, many of those ideas, I think, have uh, some applicability here in Union Square. It would be presumptuous of us to tell you what needs to be done because we've not had the opportunity to talk about them with you. So, in our proposal to you, we, in the spirit of Summer Vision, created a wordle um, that talks about how we could envision um, living, working, incubating, playing, um, a rich uh, diversity of uses that could strengthen what is so terrific about Union Square now. Um, lots of ideas. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk about up next. Um, and you, you see, I mean, from you know, the, the parcels that are available for building, but also ideas about a screen wall, an artistic screen wall that might begin to um, uh, keep out of view some of those uh, transformers that are in the district. Uh, you know, very much uh, creating an environment that's about incubating and creating food and creating a healthy <coughs> environment for the residents. Uh, connecting Boynton Yards with some artistic uh, green uh, pedestrian bridge, um, lots of ideas, um, and we hope to have the opportunity to be able to talk about these and get feedback and bring them into a plan. And now, in one minute, Kenan, because we're running out of time. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is the last slide here, and we just wanted to uh, have an opportunity to sort of uh, wrap up and uh, restate uh, the, the key points that we've been trying to make in this proposal as to why uh, this is the team uh, that is the right team uh, for the redevelopment of Union Square. Um, we're an experienced team, we're locally based, and we're capable. I think our, our resume speaks to the successes we've had in other communities, but it also speaks to our approach uh, to working with those communities to coming up with uh, tailor-made solutions. Um, we're resourceful. You heard about the uh, different types of resources, the different approaches to financing uh, that we would bring to the table, uh, again, to make sure that this development effort uh, has the flexibility um, and nimble feet that it needs uh, to really reflect uh, this very dynamic community. Um, we're collaborative. Um, you heard about the year-long charrette process um, we don't shy away from that type of engagement. In fact, we welcome it. We think that that type of engagement, um, that back and forth with the folks that live and work in the community is what ultimately leads to a project um, uh, that is successful, a project that is exciting, a project that everyone uh, is proud to be a part of. Um, again, through those processes, we want to come up with a solution uh, that is unique for Union Square. Um, we talked about some of the concepts here, promoting neighborhood <coughs> diversity, whether that's in uh, diverse income ranges of the residents le that live here, uh, whether it's diversity in uh, the business endeavors that uh, are existing or that we attract to Union Square. Um, we think that a strong community is a diverse community uh, that represents a little bit of um, all of its residents. Um, build on the existing economy. I think you've heard us say this, but uh, there's a lot about Union Square that works. We're not looking to do a, uh, a wipe clean of the slate. We want to build off of what works. We want to do urban infill for those areas that may be underdeveloped. And we want it all to work together as a cohesive community. Um, create new economic opportunities. Uh, John told you about how we approached an underperforming commercial asset one of the busiest neighborhoods of Boston and was able to work with that community to turn it into uh, something vibrant, a, uh, an economic opportunity, an economic engine working with a large institution, but also creating opportunities for retail. Um, that's something that we think uh, will work well here in Union Square. Um, and then finally, uh, just in case you haven't heard, uh, we're really here to enhance Union Square. What we want to do is build on uh, the existing um, strong creative economy, uh, work with the existing community, and really enhance Union Square uh, to become that national leader um, that we think it can be. Um, now if you flip to the next slide, 
Nancy sort of walked you through a little bit of the ideas that we have bouncing around in our head. Um, but really, this is the beginning of a process. And if you um, let us continue to work with you, um, we'll be happy to go into detail with our ideas, solicit ideas from you guys, uh, and hopefully embark on a path that leads to uh, a redeveloped Union Square that reflects uh, the wants and needs and hopes and dreams uh, of the entire community. Uh, again, thank you very much for having us here tonight. Um, hopefully we didn't go too far over and we have a, a short opportunity to respond to some questions. So, thank, thanks very much. It was a very nice presentation. Um, so we're going to try to keep these to about half an hour. So we, we've used about half an hour, but I think we can take one or two questions. Um, this clock goes about 40% faster than real time. <laughs> Very clever elementary school students we have here in Somerville. Um, are, there, are there questions from anybody on the um, committee? Here, come on up because I'm going to make sure everybody can hear. Hi, I'm Robin Champion. I'm a resident of on Union um, uh, with the Hill. I'm interested in how you balance the mix of retail in the projects you used as examples, because the one example where you listed those were all big national chains, something we're really concerned about, protecting local businesses, and particularly local artists. So if you could talk about that, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah, um, I probably should have mentioned this when we talked about it. I think, I think the retailers that are at Charles River Plaza are a function of the location that they're in. Um, certainly part of our plan and one of the things that we've talked about is uh, keeping uh, a home for a lot of the local retailers, incubator space for um, an artist lofts for a lot of the local uh, startups and, and artist community uh, that exists in Union Square today. So uh, that's very much part of our dialogue and something that you know uh, we would expect to be part of our plan. And then uh, just really quickly, I would just add to that that our approach um, to uh, the mixed use developments that I described is really to reserve that ground level retail for those types of smaller independent uh, retailers. Um, it's how we're able to marry um, the housing use uh, with the retail use. Um, then the, the only other thing I would mention is that a lot of the times these uh, selection of tenants is driven by the economics. And I think one of the other um, uh, strengths that we bring is the ability to leverage some additional resources. So we've worked with the New Market Tax Credit Program uh, that actually exists to provide uh, some additional uh, subsidy sources so that you can uh, engage those um, uh, businesses that may not be, you know, sort of balance sheet anchor tenants. Um, so that's very much something that's in, uh, in our bag of tricks, so to speak, and something that we would bring to bear here. Any, I think we can probably take one more question if there is one. Um, if not, I think we'll turn it back to Ed and, and move on. But thank, thank you very Oh, I'm sorry. Sure, come on. Uh, just two things real quick. One is, um, my name is Scott Heyman. I'm on the Citizens Advisory Committee representing SEC. And um, so could you just talk about, a little bit about, I see a lot of your projects are Mixed income often includes the housing tax credits, the market tax credits, the whole kitchen sink, if you will, of resources. Um, can you just talk briefly about that with regards to the uh, the horizon, the future of a variety of these resources? They're getting more scarce. And then second, about unit sizes in general with, with regards to a lot of the projects you've built. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think I can give sort of a primer on uh, the state of the low income housing tax credit and the new market tax credit. I think we all know uh, that there's a lot going on in Washington uh, with respect to these programs. Uh, I would say that we are um, uh, pretty confident that uh, those programs will continue <coughs> to exist in some way, shape, or form. And uh, you know, we've been working with those programs over the years, and they, they change from year to year. And one of the things we pride ourselves on is staying uh, sort of ahead of the curve, uh, reading the tea leaves, so to speak, and understanding those programs so that we can leverage the resources that we need uh, to uh, enact the visions uh, that we described here. 
So, you know, I think there's, there's a little bit of uncertainty there, um, but not to the point that we need to worry about those resources disappearing. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that um, our approach to doing these developments is not to depend wholly on the subsidies. We do look at ways that sort of the market rate housing or the large institutional tenant uh, can be structured so that those resources help to provide opportunities for smaller retailers uh, or for um, more affordable units. Um, in terms of unit sizes, you want to uh, talk about our approach to Well, I think it really depends on the place and the demographic. Uh, which is certainly influencing unit size across the market right now. I mean, we are seeing, I mean, we have seen a push to tighten up units, um, you know, one bedrooms and anywhere from 610 to 750. I mean, units just aren't being built as big as they were even 10 years ago. And I think that you really want to focus in on the market study here for what is the demographic and, and provide a broad variety. So you, you, you would have units throughout that range, you know, and a mix of ones, twos, threes, lofts. Right. And I think our approach is not to, um, you know, we want to uh, make sure that the units reflect uh, sort of the vision for the community. We're not going to be driven entirely by a market study. And, and if the time, at the appropriate time, we'd love to take uh, any members of the CAC on tours to see some of our properties and get a sense for how our units look and feel. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Trinity uh, uh, Davis uh, team. Thank you very much. You have set the bar for us. We appreciate it. Uh, Kyle, does your team need time uh, to set up? All right. Why don't we take a, just a minute or two? We have been trying to hold these meetings to two hours. Uh, we understand we've got an awful lot of work to do, so we'd rather do it right and do it fast, but we will, we will attempt as much as we possibly can to stay in that two hour uh, time limit. Just in terms of the questions for folks who may have come in late, uh, if you're walking home this evening and the light bulb appears over your head, you say, geez, I wish I had asked that, you'll have that opportunity. If you, can, if you want to ask a question, you can either reach me through SPCD, reach Amanda, uh, of my staff, Sue Thomas is here, wig is available, so don't, please don't hesitate to reach out if there, if there is anything that you think is unclear or you want us to ask of the individual teams, we're happy to do so. And again, I see some new faces here, I just want everyone uh, to realize that if you go to the OSPCD webpage and you go under economic uh, development, you will see that each of the nine uh, responses is available online. The minutes of the meetings are available online, so please, uh, we hope that you will avail yourselves of the opportunity. So I'm not going to... Alright, I'm Kyle Warwick. I'm a uh, principal of the Redgate team. I want to thank the City of Somerville and the CAC for your dedication and, and know that this public process will certainly yield a better plan. Our proposal is to become an active extension of you and everything you have created thus far. <clears throat> to build on the unique flavor and the success of Union Square. That is why we're here tonight. A little background on me and, and Redgate. I ran the development group at Spalding and Sly and later led the 250 person full service real estate company, investment company, overseeing all disciplines of real estate. Exactly the experience needed here. We sold Spalding Sly in 2006, which allowed us to create Redgate in 2009, an investment and advisory services firm. The Redgate team includes eight former colleagues and partners from Spalding Sly. We have a long and proud history of creating value through the unique master development process. This RFQ reflects who we are and the challenges ahead are the opportunities for this great team. We believe we have assembled the best team. Large yet familiar, the team introductions will start with our planning team. I'm Lisa Serafin, I'm a partner of Kyle's at Redgate and I will lead the regulatory and planning portion of the project. 
kind of the mundane Zarya and a little bit of the microbes and the housing development that I need that. I'm Kishore Varanasi, I'm a principal at uh, CBT Architects. I lead their design and planning effort uh, on behalf of this team. I'm Jesse Barakon. I'm the founder and managing director of Graffito. I'll be working on the placemaking and retail portions of the project. I'm Karen White from Housing and Associates, and Transportation Planners, and also Assistant Facility Engineering and Residential Development. Hello, I'm Bill Madden, Senior Associate with Design for the Landscape Architects. We also work in the Public Park Dom as well. Think of this team as our horizontal team. And now for the implementation team, we are anchored by a $2 billion opportunistic fund with the Rock Point Group. Uh, Lisa, Damian, and myself will lead the master planning and development um, access. And um, we will have Highgate Hotels for the hospitality portion of this project. Highgate has 25,000 hotel rooms um, that they manage and have developed over the past 15 years. Gate Residential will handle all the residential development. And our life science partner, we have partners here in the audience from Longfellow. I'm Dan O'Connell. I'm uh, on the board of Brinkgate and I'm a partner at Longfellow, which is a life science lab and office development. Great. Um, our team, next slide, our team has tackled North America's most important projects but closer to home and within four mile radius of where we sit tonight, we have master plan and developed over 10 million square feet of mixed use development in the last 15 years, including 4,000 units of housing, 6 million square feet of office and lab, 400,000 square feet of neighborhood retail, and 3,000 hotel rooms. All of our projects have involved a process similar to the one we are about to embark on. The next slide depicts some of our larger master planning efforts, all realizing their full potential. North Point, the Convention Center District in San Juan, and Fan Pier on the Boston waterfront. Not because of the weather, but because Puerto Rico does have some similarities with what we're about to embark on from a master development standpoint. We created a legal entity in the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico that had broad powers. It had powers over planning, financing, eminent domain, and bonding. We took over a failed plan and created a vibrant mix of uses and were able to tap the public markets to build the infrastructure and get development done. Representative projects include development at North Point, Maxwell's Green here in Somerville, a newly approved plan for a six-story, nine-unit condominium project, in the Fort Point District of Boston. The ICA building at Fan Pier and BioSquare, a 220,000 square foot lab and office building in the South End. So a range of small to large projects. Each project is unique and we will pull from each of them to help realize the vision here in Union Square. been involved with is unique, and this one is no exception. Um, with me is, as was introduced, Kishore Varanasi from CBT and Jesse Barakon from Graffito. And the, we've worked together, this team, the three of us, as well as the other two who've been introduced here, have worked on some of the most complex stakeholder projects uh, in the area. And so when we look at Union Square, we see a lot of opportunity, a lot of opportunity for for growth, but also a lot of opportunity for engagement. The process that you all have gone through really serves as the vision and the value setting for what's to happen next. So we wanted to talk through, uh, through our, our process and how we think that some of the foundation here in Union Square can contribute to that process. But first I want to know, can everybody hear me? Okay. So, so again, summer vision is really the foundation and the value setting. And so our approach from here is to think about how do you translate those values into a concrete plan that can guide development over time. We all know this project is not going to be um, something that happens overnight. 
This growth is going to happen over a number of years, and there needs to be a beacon, a guidepost, to make sure that the values are, are incorporated all the way along. And it, it's a tricky business because it needs to be both flexible and, and strategic and thoughtful for how it moves forward. I think one of the remarkable things that happened here is that I've sat in this exact room in some of the meetings that led up to this. Uh, fortunate enough to contribute to some of the Union Square zoning on a pro bono basis, uh, as well as work on inner bell. A uh, lot of places where we work don't have this kind of vision, and we have to start ground up. Uh, the wonderful thing is there's a great, great platform. You know what you want to do. You've spent a tremendous amount of time, and we can take those bones and really move forward and realize a plan. And as Lisa pointed out, um, you know, I don't live too far from here. Uh, it's the next town, of course, on the other side, we can see. But um, I moved through Union Square, passed through Union Square, and came to Union Square over the last 15 years. It's a remarkable evolution of what happened. I've only been 15 years, and I'm sure a lot of you have been here for a long time. But what's interesting is, this kind of ecosystem that Union Square is, has been built, and it's something that every other project anywhere else in the world would kill for, it, including the North Points and the fan piers where we had to fabricate this thing. So the way we see the opportunity is really something that is an incremental, careful, step-by-step -step process. It's not something that you can manufacture in two or three years, but it's the idea of incremental phasing where you do one step that leads to the next step, the idea of city building, taking into consideration this ecosystem and how do you enhance it. And that's where the strength of the team comes in. That's where, you know, the projects as visuals, as Carl pointed out, will be very different from Union Square, but it's the process that's very important that we want to show. Yeah, and, and I think to piggyback on what Kishore is saying, I think that so much of this Whoever comes in here and whoever's a master developer, I think one of the key words is going to be momentum and preservation. And I think the opportunity, the reason all these people are in this room and the opportunity that exists here is that the soul of this neighborhood already exists and it's pretty powerful. And the question is, how does this next effort, you know, take the last 10 years of development in Union Square and take the next 10 years and say, how do we preserve that and how do we amplify it? And in that sense, you know, momentum is kind of so much of what we all have talked about and figuring out how we kind of carry that on and carry that forward. And for me, certainly on the ground floor, and there was a question earlier, that's, that is so, so important to the ground floor. And that so gets to kind of the sole part of what this project is about. So it's really about the people and the public realm and what the experiences are on the ground floor. And that's really in all the projects that, that Kyle, particularly the master planning and the development project that we've been involved in as a group, as a team, we have, um, we really focus on the ground floor first because when you do that, when you focus on the public realm, when you focus on the retail, you focus on the public space connection, infrastructure improvements, that's where you're creating value for the neighborhood, the community, as well as for any potential uh, upper floor users and the market in the future. So that's where our main our main focus is. And again, you know, we'll just scroll through some of this um, some of the stuff that we have been thinking about, about Union Square, and the opportunities here that, that there are to build on things. <laughs> we're pulling out a bongo microphone right. here. Um, the opportunity to build on what's here, and I think, Jesse, you, you said it best early on when you were talking about, you know, the, the preservation and, and being incremental and in change. Yeah, I think that, um, so first of all, all the projects that my team works on, um, I always, always take me back to Union Square. And I think what a lot of developers are trying to do in New England and certainly Boston is figure out what, is, what you've done so well here. Um, last night I went to a cidery that opened uh, just outside of Union Square. And then I ended up in a bar, back bar, you all probably know it, that like exists in a place where it shouldn't really exist. Right? It just shouldn't. But it does. And I think that is what this project is about, is figuring out, again, the word amplification. How do we take that and build upon it? And I think so many neighborhoods are trying to figure that out. And I think that's the blessing of this project. And I think that's kind of what we've been talking about and trying to be flexible in the process as we move forward and, and really embrace that stuff. So one of the areas we wanted to touch, touch on was transportation. So if I went past it. There we go. Transportation, which is, you know, the, the change that transportation creates, the opportunity that it creates, the fact that Somerville is very well serviced uh, by transportation generally, but that Union Square used to have it and doesn't as much anymore, and this is an exciting moment. 
but really how do you how do you integrate how does that affect other other public realm changes and how do we think about what that what that does for people's movement throughout throughout Union Square and Somerville generally. You know, one of the other ways to put it is that, you know, Union Square organically grow, grew without any transportation. And now you've set the basics and you have this asset. And how do you bring the other pieces into the mix by enhancing what you have, but at the same time creating the new pieces? We kind of quickly went through the businesses, the mix of businesses that you have here. Tremendous amount of incubator businesses like the Design Annex, uh, Farm Labs, and so on and so forth. You know that. Again, these are people who are looking for cool spaces and cool neighborhoods, and Union Square is attracting them, but we don't know what the program is going to be eventually, and to the extent that you're attracting commercial dollars, how do you balance the, 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 the bigger commercial tenants and the smaller commercial tenants, very similar to the retail, is going to be a great opportunity that we want to tackle. And, and certainly the history that exists here in Union Square and the fact that there are many existing beautiful historic buildings and how do you integrate that into in, into the future you know part of it is with architecture part of it's with ground floor continuity and how but part of it is the fact that each of these buildings grew over time and they all represent something different and so the key challenge here is as as you build out these new parcels how do you how do you maintain that organic nature how do you maintain what those older buildings represent. And one of the buildings that we've been working on most recently is this uh, building that Kyle pointed out earlier on, it, called 338 Congress Street. It's in, it's in Fort Point Channel right now. It's, a, it's the um, parking lot that you walk through if you're going to the Children's Museum, the small parking lot on the corner of Farnsworth. And that, there is a row of manufacturing buildings that used to be a manufacturing building, but is now, it was, uh, it was demolished in the 30s. But we've managed to create a design in a historic district, we had to go through landmarks, that evokes the, the, the past while representing the future. And I think that's the kind of balance that, that's needed here. So we've talked a lot about your vision and about the opportunities in Union Square. And again, we can't say enough that the vision piece um, is really the foundation and the important part of this. Um, in terms of our process, you know, we, we think that the planning process and engaging with the community is the most important piece. We've done this um, at, at uh, FAM Pier was a great example where there was no foundation when we got there. There was no zoning. There was, it was a barren wasteland. And we were able to come in, and actually there have been two uh, developers there before us. Both had failed in trying to get the, the 20 acres permitted and to gain community acceptance of what they were doing. Our team was able to come in, and many of the members are sitting right here, was, was able to come in and really start to focus the public process in the area, really start to talk about how do we want to interface with the water? How do we interface with the new transportation? How do we interface with the existing residential communities? And, try, and we are really spearheaded and we're the catalyst for figuring that stuff out. And I think that's something that we can do here as well. And part of the issue on phasing, you know, the delivering the public benefit up front, you know, ICA was really the first building to be built on Fampier before any other development has happened. So this idea of building the DNA of a city with every phase and not just treating phasing as how, much, how many square feet of certain tenant that I can get, is this is where this is really a marathon, not a sprint. You have to build every step in a way that you get the right mix of Union Square into it, rather than saying that I can bring X, Y, and Z into the Union Square. And that's what this team does. And in the, in the case of North Point, which is right next to it, it's a different scale. But there, the opportunity was the city asked for two and a half acres of open space. We actually gave 10 acres of open space. And the reason for that <coughs> was it actually solved all the stormwater issues for the whole development, but also created value. And the little known sort of thing is that the, the green space actually is oriented towards the Minuteman bike trail. The point is, the bike trail is not built yet. But this idea of the belief that there is a future that can happen, and you can do something today about it. That's what the essence of Union Square is going to be. It's playing the long-term game, but also playing the short-term game. So we're mixing and matching, acting today, but also allowing for the future to happen. Yeah, and I, I think the one thing I would add, and the one thing that really excites me about this team is that, you know, so often developers do this in a vacuum, and it's kind of our plan, here you go. And I think the exciting part about this process and what the city's facilitating is to be able to do this with a community like you all that cares so much about Union Square and quite frankly, you know, has been 
very responsible for all the goodness that exists here. And the idea that we can have these conversations with folks in the community is very much what I think this process is all about. So it's quite exciting, actually. And one of the projects that three of us are working on together over the past few years has been um, some iterations and interventions in, in Kendall Square. And I think, you know, uh, some of the tools that, it's a very active and engaged community. And some of the tools that we've been able to use there are things like having storefronts where people could come in and talk about ideas and, and you know, have charrettes and, and wine mixers and other sorts of ways to help in, integrate all of the input from all the stakeholders. I mean, I think, you know, we have a fairly large team but we know how to work in a large team, and we enjoy working in large groups. And so, because we think that's where the best ideas come from. And engaging the community is only more of that. It's more ideas, more thoughts that, that we didn't have and that we can incorporate into a project. And so we, we really welcome the, the, the breadth of the engagement here. I think the, the, the point is we want to do on-site and on, online both, because you know, if you look at the demographic of Somerville, you know, every demographic says you know, your median is around 25 to 34, we want to reach out to those uh, people, but as well as people like this room, we want to have a place where everybody can come together. And Mind Mixer is something that we're using as a very effective tool uh, as an online virtual city hall, which is a possibility. Again, these are all tools, all, all of them may not be applicable, but we'll try those with you. So uh, we'd just like to take a minute to talk about the, about the public realm and the importance of taking vision and values and turning them into sort of a concrete plan that, that can guide the development over time. And as I said, you know, there are, there are folks, uh, you know, developers who will, who will have a user or have a, 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 um, a, a building plan in mind, and they'll come to the table on a property and they'll find a location for that, and they'll think about the public realm second. They'll think about the ground floor last. And that's not our approach. Our approach is to think about the ground, the ground plane first, the public realm first, and the building program will follow from there. So, um, you want to talk about the, yeah. how that happens in retail? Yeah, I think the, the best retail, in my opinion, is a reflection of the neighborhood in which it's located, right? And I think that um, thinking about a project of this size, you know, the, the challenge, and this will be hard, is how do you fundamentally reflect the values of a neighborhood, of this specific neighborhood, Median Square, with a program at the ground floor, and how do all the respective pieces kind of talk to each other and bleed into each other? And I think, in, you know, the funny part about Kendall Square, which all, all of us worked on together, was that was a real challenge to kind of get the first piece done and set momentum. And I think, I go back to the point I made earlier, the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth piece are done here. So the question for us, kind of from a public realm perspective, is how do we kind of interpret that and reapply it? Um, so hopefully that from a, from a From a physical standpoint, I know you told us you have five minutes and we'll wrap it up quickly. Uh, despite all the wonderful things, um, uh, I can say that there is a lot more to be desired from a public realm standpoint in Union Square. Um, you know, a lot of people will answer this differently. What's the identity of Union Square? How do you remember, when, when I say Union Square, what comes to your mind first? Is it the traffic? Is it the infrastructure or is it the fire station? These are the kinds of conversations you want to have. How do you rein in these pieces? And the, one of the beautiful things you've done, by the way, is instead of going building by building developer, you've actually assembled a master developer and look at the whole thing. That gives a whole host of opportunities to push and pull. You know, maybe there is a thing that you emphasized closer to a neighborhood that is 70 feet. We can actually push and pull. You know, we can lower this to a different height and push it somewhere else. Same thing with infrastructure. So, Currently, the intersection of Somerville Avenue, Webster is sort of the Union Square, but you have other places that are emerging, Somerville Avenue and Prospect, and then Somerville Avenue and Webster, where the transit station is going to be. You want to talk about Union Square as multiple nodes that come together eventually with all of this development. So creating that network is going to be very important as a, as a, as a, part, of, as a part of the process, so it's not mem memorized as, a, as an automobile place. And the most important thing is that the plan can be pulled off. You know, we have never worked on a plan that wasn't implemented. And you know, the heart of the matter and the crux happens at the intersection of the, these three circles that we've depicted up there. Infrastructure, the mixed use real estate team, and the public-private partnership. It's in that zone that the next chapter in Union Square will happen. The importance of viability and public assistance and the, and the unique understanding of the mixed use development and our unique opportunity to work with the public and private partnership. So 
you know, the guardrail to all of this is the master plan. And as you saw with Lisa, Kishore, Jesse, this is going to be our team. This is going to be our interaction. And we, we welcome questions. We can open it up to the audience at this point. Next way. Okay, we, we do have time for some questions. Um, so, CAC members, do you have any questions? Members of the public. We got a couple, we got a little, little bit of time. I didn't think you answered all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they read the proposal. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we don't have to take questions. I know it's a lot of, a lot of information, but it's really terrific. And, to see a full audience is also terrific. Um, yeah, and we, that's, that's a great idea, Amanda, actually. So if we do have um, a little time at the end, we'll, we'll have some question time for anybody. Sure, come on up. Oh, no, 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 come on up. Just a pro process question. Yeah. Um, can you just make the slides available? Uh, that's a good idea, and I think we would need the uh, assistance of um, for the permission of the development teams, but the assistance of Amanda and Ed. Um, it's a great question. And, and for those who don't know, um, Amanda has been putting up all the information on the website. The minutes from our prior meetings, all of the um, responses to the RFQ are up. So we're, we're doing pretty well with, with that um, side of everything. Okay, so I think we can let, let it come up. and. We'll give the next group a couple minutes. Okay, thank you. Could we take just a few minutes and let the members of the HYM teams set up while these other folks uh, begin to uh, break down? Would that be helpful? Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Tom O'Brien, and I'm uh, the managing director of the HYM Investment Group. So we're the third group to present uh, to you tonight. Um, we are honored to be here with you and very excited to tell you a little bit about ourselves and about uh, some of the things we, we've been thinking about with regard to Union Square. Um, we've got a presentation that I'm gonna try and run through in about 20 to maybe 25 minutes or so so that we can get to questions and answers. I, I hear that clearly, frankly, honestly, in the, in the course of these sorts of presentations. Uh, the question and answer session is my favorite part of it anyway, so uh, we'd love to get to that with you folks. So let me begin. Um, so the name of our company again is the HYM Investment Group. Uh, we're a, a private company based in, in Boston. And my role is to be the managing director. Uh, just a minute about myself. Um, I'm probably unique in, in the group of developers who will get up here in that I've worked both in the private sector and in the public sector. Uh, my job, as, a, as you know now, is to be a developer, but previous to that I was a uh, direct, director of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. I did that in the, in the 90s. And so I think from uh, your perspective, what's important about that is I have a good sense of, of process and a real commitment to process, community process, and a real strong instinct as to uh, how to listen to people, how to use planning processes in, appropriate, in an appropriate manner, and how to get things done. Um, so uh, uh, we're excited to, to talk to you a little bit about that, but really one of the most important things you need to understand about us is that we care deeply about process and about listening to people. It's really one of our key uh, aspects. Um, we've assembled uh, a great team of people. It's a broad-based team. I'm actually not gonna uh, spend too much of your time tonight going through each of the specific people, but we've assembled a great team of people uh, that have uh, the technical expertise to get this done, the financial expertise to get this done, and to work with you carefully to make sure that, uh, that things go really well. The three key groups, though, that you're gonna hear from tonight are really the, the sort of the on-the-ground engagement team. So it includes HYM. If I could pause just for a second, I'd like just the HYM folks to, to stand up. So if I could have our HYM team stand up. Paul, David, Marcel, I'm not even gonna introduce all the folks, but I'd like you to look at the faces of these people because if selected, I promise you, you will get to know us very well. We will be here in this community quite often. We'll, we will be part of uh, your effort to uh, both, both preserve and enhance what's wonderful about Union Square and move Union Square to the, uh, to the next level. But this is a group of people I, I guarantee you, you will grow to love uh, as I have. It's a great group of folks, all HYM employees. Thank you very much. 
Um, in addition to that, I'm joined uh, tonight by Anthony Galluccio of uh, Galluccio and Watson LLP. Uh, I'm proud to be working with Anthony across a variety of projects, uh, both in Somerville and in Cambridge. Anthony is a former state senator, former mayor of Cambridge, but he also specifically represented this area. Uh, and Anthony and I have enjoyed a wonderful relationship over the last, uh, well, we've known each other a while, but specifically a business relationship over the last four or five years, and have really enjoyed working with one another uh, and, and implementing uh, great projects and great plans. In addition to that, uh, Prelowicz Chalinski, David Chalinski is here, Eric Brown is here as well. Uh, David's going to be presenting in part uh, with me uh, today. Prelowicz Chalinski, uh, their office is uh, located right in Inman Square, just uh, a couple of stone's throws from here. Uh, and, uh, and we really feel great about their involvement with us because they have a very specific uh, group of, uh, of projects that they've worked on that have produced successful retail developments, have produced successful senses of place, and have really um, made sure that, that communities that, that are in the midst of great change that those communities have felt empowered in terms of how they manage that change. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. So you'll hear from those three, but you'll get to know us really well, I, I, I can tell you if we're, uh, if we're selected. So let me just start with kind of a little bit more about who we are and really emphasize for you, if I can, our values and our experience, what we stand for and why we think we're the best team for you to select for this, um, to be the master developer for this, for this area. First and most important thing, as I said up front, is that we're dedicated to community process, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk more about that. But this is a community that is undergoing change. Every, every vibrant urban community, uh, frankly, in the history of, of the world, has undergone change. It's sort of the definition of what a city is. And this is a community that is right in the midst of, of undergoing significant change. And so um, we believe that what's required is a group that understands how to manage change and how to make certain that the key things that ought to be preserved, that you care about in Union Square, are preserved, and that the key things that you care about making changes with, uh, or, or implementing change for, uh, that those things do in fact happen in a way that you feel good about. Now, it never happens that 100% of the group of the, uh, folks in a room are 100% happy, but our role is to help try and manage that, and what you'll see from us is we're very good and very intense in spending tons of time with people in one-on-one -on -one meetings, small group meetings, large meetings like this, we actually love doing it. It's kind of what we do for a living. So uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why we've done that. In addition to that, we've got specific experience in enhancing communities through developing of uh, development of commercial, retail, and residential projects. So what I'm saying there is we have specific experience in all three of those areas. So to the extent that you want a commercial developer, that's us. If you want a retail developer, that's us. If you want a residential developer, that's us as well. In addition to that, the third point, we have a proven ability to manage effectively large projects. This is a large, complicated project, as you all know, with a lot of different moving parts, and we've done this uh, previously and we're doing it now. Fourth point, and this is really important, the reason is, as Ed just said, the reason we're here tonight is to talk about the changes that are going to come to this community in part through the development of uh, the Green Line extension at Union Square. Other developers will talk about the fact that they have MBTA experience, and we have that, but we are specifically working on the Green Line Extension right now. We're working specifically all the time with the Green Line Extension team, that specific MBTA team, which is unique. And then fifth, um, we're going to talk about our commitment to open space, which is really central, I think, to um, uh, the conversations that have, been, uh, that have been had so far about Union Square, and we're deeply committed to open space as a key part of, of uh, communities and in control of change in their lives. So first relevant experience is North Point, um, and in that one, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about our collaborative community process, but first I wanna talk about, uh, about Somerville. North Point we acquired in 2010. Uh, it was a, a project that had uh, some permits in place in Cambridge, a uh, little bit of a process in Boston, but nothing had been done in Somerville. Um, and at, that, at the point that we acquired the, the property, what was clear to us is that uh, the previous uh, developers had thought about uh, planting all housing in the Somerville portion of, of uh, this site. And let me just point out what the border is. So this site is located not too far from here. Um, it's uh, uh, right along on Senior O'Brien Highway. Uh, and this red squiggly line is the border between Somerville and Cambridge. It used to be a river years and years ago. And so everything on the upper portion of this side, slide uh, is in Somerville. Everything on the lower portion of this slide is in Cambridge. And when we came upon it, there had been nothing done really from a process perspective in Somerville. So uh, we started the process. It took us a long time to get to the point where we really uh, were prepared to, uh, to put in place a proposal. 
And what we focused on was the desire on the part of the community to make sure that in the Somerville portion of this site, that there was commercial development that was, uh, that was built. Uh, and as I said previously, it was all housing that had been proposed for this site. Uh, that meant that it was pretty complicated for us. It meant that we had to go back to Cambridge to make sure that Cambridge would allow us to trade out some of the commercial uh, that was planned for their side and trade in some of the housing that had been planned for the Somerville side. A little bit complicated on the Cambridge side. We completed all that with Cambridge and then have recently completed um, the planning and are in the midst of, of uh, finishing the community master plan in the Somerville portion of the site that will make uh, specifically clear that a 350,000 square foot commercial development will be built on the Somerville side. When we finished that in front of the Board of Aldermen, uh, there was a unanimous vote of the Board of Aldermen and not a single person stood to oppose us on that project. And that's a key theme for us. That at the end of the day, both in Cambridge and in Somerville, we uh, completed the, the repermitting of this site without a single uh, 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 negative vote. And we feel really great about where we are and how good people feel about the process uh, that we completed at the end of the day when we uh, completed this work. But, you know, one of the things that, um, that we've put in our, our proposal, and I, I just would encourage you to, uh, to read the, the work that we presented to you, one of the things that we put in the back, or one of the sections that we put in the back, were a series of letters from community leaders um, because, frankly, if we talk about our the desire to uh, produce a successful community process, uh, many of you may uh, sort of see it as, as us just simply tooting our own horn. But frankly, there's a ton of letters in there that, that talk about um, uh, other people telling, us, uh, telling you about uh, the community process that we've engaged in and what we've done successfully. So frankly, from our perspective, the most important thing is third-party verification. I've called out a couple of letters for the purpose of this slide. But at this point, just from a process perspective, I just wanted to introduce uh, Anthony Gluccio to talk a little bit about uh, what we did for process in, uh, at North Point and, and a little bit more about, uh, about our commitment to that. Anthony. Thank you, Tom. And uh, Tom overstated our current relationship because our relationship has actually been strained the last couple months because I get so excited about Union Square that uh, Tom stopped answering my calls because every day I'd say, Tom, do you know that there's an arts overlay district there that they've worked on for five years? Do you know about Summer Vision? Have you been to Machu Picchu? Do you know there are health centers in Union Square? There are churches. There are schools there. There are senior citizens that go there every day. It is an immigrant community uh, that has great and rich history. So, you know, I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, Tom described uh, what I'm doing now, which, which one of the biggest challenges is somebody that goes from public to private as a land use attorney is you get nervous that your clients will sort of hide behind existing zoning, uh, hide behind what are existing rights. And Tom was one of my first clients, and somebody, as somebody who came from the public sector, it was really easy to work with Tom. Having uh, been the former BRA director, he understands that what's in zoning doesn't necessarily mean it's what a community wants. Uh, and when we started in East Cambridge and Somerville, both communities had new and different perspectives on what North Point should be. Uh, folks at Brick Bottom and, and other folks in Somerville waited heavily. They wanted more commercial development on the Somerville side. Uh, East Cambridge invented the idea of a new public market. Uh, they wanted Monsignor O'Brien Highway to be narrower so pedestrians uh, could cross safely. Tom didn't respond by saying, sorry, we." We have existing permits that we paid for. We can't afford that. Those responses were refreshing. Uh, it, it created a new atmosphere in that community uh, in, in both Cambridge and Somerville. And I think that's what makes Tom unique. Um, what I would say is, and I think what we're, we're getting across tonight is, there are going to be honest conflicts during this process. Uh, the folks that have worked on the new Somerville zoning, uh, Summer Vision, the Overlay District, those folks will all be involved, but there'll be new voices. Folks will wake up and say, what new zoning? How big? How tall? Wait a second. Uh, and when I look at this team and I look at Tom's background and my background and, and the integrity of this team, which is really about public process, the fluidity that's going to be required here, the ability to manage change, to temper all those different op uh, opinions, and probably at the end of the day to make sure that sort of the simple concepts like will the diversity continue to exist? Will Ricky's Flowers still have a place in Union Square? What kind of housing will be here? Will it be the Union Square that we all love going forward? And I, I really believe that uh, Tom's, Tom's background, the integrity of this team will respect all those new voices that, uh, that continue to weigh in over this lengthy process. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks. 
So in the end of the day, for North Point, as that example uh, you know, fleshes out, we're now building a building. You can see the, the crane in the sky, so we're building a building there now. So that project now is back on track, and we're developing that, that site uh, even as we speak. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to run through this next one uh, rather quickly. So we are also the developer uh, of a, a site in downtown Boston where the Government Center Garage is currently located. The Government Center Garage you'll recognize is, is easily one of the uh, uh, most ugly buildings in Boston. Uh, that's, the, that's the garage in all its glory right in the center of this, of this, uh, uh, this, this uh, slide. Uh, but what you need to also understand about it is it's located in the midst of some of the most politically active neighborhoods in Boston, the North End, the West End, uh, Beacon Hill, all those pieces have, uh, all those neighborhoods have a piece of this project. And it's, um, it's actually a fascinating project to work on. I won't spend too much time going through the plan that we've created, but it is a plan that allows us uh, to demolish a portion of the garage that comes over Congress Street, remove sort of the offending portion of the garage, and replace the garage with a really interesting mixed-use project that will have uh, great retail at the ground floor, reconnect these neighborhoods, make uh, pedestrian connections between the North End and Beacon Hill for the first time in 40 or 50 years. But most importantly, for the purposes of tonight, which you need to understand, the part that we're most proud of when we completed that process, which required two votes in front of the, the Boston Redevelopment Authority Board, uh, two votes in front of the, uh, the Zoning Commission in Boston, when we completed those votes, not a single person, not a person from the West End, not a person from Beacon Hill, not a person from the North End, stood up to oppose us on that project. And that's the part that we're most proud of. We spent a ton of time, we probably spent four years in different meetings uh, with people, making sure that people understood what was going to happen, and making sure that uh, they were clear uh, that, that what we wanted to do was produce something special that could remove an unsightly building, but more importantly, reconnect communities and make things work. Um, and so that's, you know, as a result of that, what we're going to do is be able to replace the unsightly garage with a, a streetscape that really works for people, with great retail, um, with a site that, um, that at the end of the day is going to be something totally different uh, for Boston. And again, I would encourage you to read the material that we've, we've uh, offered, which offers a series of testimonies uh, from people who uh, you know, who are community folks who, who we worked with talking about our commitment to process and, and this letter specifically uh, mentions the fact that for anybody who's ever done anything with the West End, for us to come through a process like this and not have a single person from the West End stand up and oppose us, it's a very unusual uh, thing. So um, at the end of the day, really what we're about is, is trying to work with you to preserve what's authentic about, about Union Square. Um, this, is, uh, this is a site, this is an area, a neighborhood uh, that, that is the real thing. And frankly, for, uh, for all of us who are in this room who care about communities and for all of us who, who care about uh, doing sensitive development within communities, the fact that Union Square is the real thing and it's authentic matters to us and frankly positions this area to be successful on a variety of different levels. So we really want to man help you manage the changes that are ahead and preserve an already dy dynamic uh, community. You know this, that it's a proud, uh, diverse and vibrant community. So I really don't have to, to go over that with you. And you're never going to hear us uh, stand up here and sort of tell you what we think should happen at Union Square. In part, what we're going to try and do is listen and filter and kind of reflect back on you and say, okay, as a result of that, here are some ideas, here are some proposals, here's what, here's what we're sensing uh, the community would like to see as we move forward. In addition to that, you've done, you've done already a ton of planning yourselves. So summer vision, as Anthony mentioned, and a variety of other things that have been done already, you've told us in large part what it is you want to do. And really what we're about is continuing to listen to you and trying to implement some of those pieces. There's also kind of the B side, we call it, of, of Union Square, which everyone would acknowledge. And those are some areas that, that I think people would acknowledge uh, do deserve some change, right? Some areas that aren't producing in the way that, um, that uh, some other portions of Union Square are already producing for the community. And so those are part of the change as well. Um, some of those involve, you know, it, it is certainly well known to everybody in this room that the city of Somerville, and specifically this neighborhood, has uh, among the, the highest density in the United States of America. And certainly it's a more dense uh, city, Somerville is citywide, than any other city in, uh, in the Northeast. It's, it's a, a city that uh, lacks open space um, and, and needs open space. Plus two, we, we recognize the fact that with the development that's sort of been proposed in the zoning or, or contemplated in the zoning, there's a lot of work to be done on, on what's going to happen with traffic and how that's all going to play out. Um, so there's a lot of questions and a lot of pieces that, that go into managing change that we're prepared for and looking forward to. Certainly there's a rich history here which we're excited to be part of um, and excited to be working with you, you know, as we, as we plan for a bright future. 
But I want to introduce David Chalinski, if I could, to talk about the concept of sort of placemaking and sort of what it is we're after here as we, as we continue to work with you, David. So I'm uh, the spokesman for the design team uh, tonight. But what I want to suggest to you is uh, often during these kinds of uh, processes, we really focus on the buildings, we focus on you know, what's happening in the buildings, we focus on zoning and height and things. I will tell you that the success of the public realm, the success of placemaking, is really in the places between those buildings. It's in the streets, it's in the pocket parks, it's in the green space that we create. Because that's where the civic life actually takes place. So in crafting the plan that we're going to work together to provide on site, we need to think about how to accommodate uh, the people of the neighborhood uh, and greater Somerville coming together. And uh, if we look at the next slide, um, looking at creating spaces and opportunities, uh, not for just formal gathering, but actually neighbors meeting neighbors, uh, people informally uh, living together, shopping together, uh, creating this public space, uh, and then essentially, and people have sort of talked about it a little bit tonight, the activities that we put on the ground floor that are adjacent to these spaces that we create, their purpose is really to enliven and to uh, make them vital uh, urban spaces. Uh, and how do we do that? Uh, what I want to tell you is that, you know, over the course of this discussion, there's going to be conversations about four-story buildings, eight-story buildings, ten-story buildings, all kinds of conversations are going to take place. But I want to tell you that the best part about cities really lives in the first 30 feet uh, of any city. So how you care for that, uh, how building facades are managed in that zone, uh, how the uses that abut that zone uh, and how they enliven the street uh, are really, uh, and this is a little diagram about it, but that's really how we all experience it. Uh, and very often, you know, people won't remember whether they walk by a five-story building or a six-story building uh, because their experience in that first 30 feet is really the memorable piece. And that's what the design team uh, that I'm speak spokesman for tonight is really committed to bringing to. Thank you, David. So just a few other pieces that I want to make sure that I go over. Um, the first is, again, the Green Line extension coordination. So, uh, so we have specific experience working with the relocation and the creation of the Green Line extension. So, you know, here at Leachmere, when we first came into this site, uh, this, this process was really stuck. And, uh, and we went through a process working with the Green Line extension team to make sure that, uh, that uh, we negotiated a new transaction with the MBTA. And so now we've freed up the possibility. The purpose of this is, is that you should know we spend tons of time every month with the Green Line Extension team specifically. They know us, we know them. And what that means is, when you look at the Monsignor Bryan Highway piece of this, a lot of what we did here at Leachmere wasn't just the design of the station, it was also the creation of new streets, new sidewalks, all the pieces that come with the new station, which will also matter in the creation of the new station here at Union Square. So we know those people, we spend a ton of time with them. They know us, they trust us, we trust them, and we frankly think we're, we're very well positioned to help you as you start to think about the creation of this, this station at, uh, at Union Square. There's also tons of coordination that needs to happen with other state agencies, MassDOT, uh, the, the city, all those sorts of things. Those are things that we're very adept at and very experienced at, and frankly look forward to working with, with all of you on. Uh, we have, as I said, a very specific commitment to open space, and so we thought we'd show just one brief thing tonight. Um, again, as I said, we're never going to come in here and say that, um, uh, that w here's what we think should happen in Union Square, except for maybe tonight. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, tonight, uh, what we, what, as we were noodling about this and we were sort of thinking about open space, here these are pictures of the open space that has been created at North Point. 25% of the built space at North Point has to be committed to open space, so we're, we've embraced that. And so as we looked at the plan here, and we focused on, again, uh, these parcels and the group of the parcels, we sort of said what's missing here is a real sense of where the open space can show up. And these are, this is, again, the map that is in the RFQ. So we sort of looked at it and said, well, what if we took one large parcel and created Union Square Park? Now, as my friend Anthony pointed out to me, the, the, the place where we thought this was relatively logic, logical right here um, does contain Ricky's Flowers, which 
people love, I believe. So, you know, certainly there's a ton of flexibility in, in the way that this would be created. But our role is not to tell you what Union Square should be. Our role is to hopefully work with you and be provocative as we start to think things through. And we're unafraid to think outside the box. As Anthony said, we're not going to stand up here and say, yeah, the zoning contemplates a building of X uh, 150 feet, an FAR of Y, here's what it is. The process outlined in the zoning is about the community and the developer working to shape the specific buildings and shape the specific proposal so that it works for the community and it makes financial sense for the developer. That's what we love doing and that's what we're about doing today. So that's why we, we put this up. So just in conclusion, let me just, again, we're dedicated to a community process. Think of us as the community people who love doing this work. We've enhanced communities with all three types, commercial, re retail, and residential. We have a proven ability to effectively manage complex projects, and we have very specific Green Line MBTA experience, which is unique, and we have that commitment to open space. I thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yep, thank you. So um, I think we need to give a hand to all three teams. If that's <laughs> really a lot of great, great attention to the heart of Union Square and the community. Um, do people on the committee have questions? We've got time. I've got one that I'd be interested to hear all three teams speak to. Yeah. Is what do they see is going to be their team specific biggest challenge moving forward that they're going to really have to, uh, it's going to be sort of a growth thing for them or either something in the neighborhood that they think is going to be particularly um, most challenging. Okay, so it's directed to all three teams. We'll let you go first, but maybe if we could just have one person from each of the other two teams come up to help with their answer. Um, so I, I would say uh, one piece that's a challenge is we heard very clearly in the process that we uh, have been involved in at North Point that um, what generally the leadership in the city of Somerville would like to see built next in the city would be commercial office or lab buildings, right? From a, it's true from a community perspective, it's true from a tax perspective, all those sorts of things. So for us, you know, one of the things that as we look through this, and we look at Union Square, and we, we've looked carefully to try and see where are there opportunities to think about the potential for commercial development. And what's happening right now in the, in the, uh, uh, in the sort of the development ranks is, is um, it's very clear that what's driving the kinds of companies that would come to a, a, a building here, uh, the kinds of companies that would be leading edge technology companies or leading edge life, uh, com life science companies, those kinds of companies are driven by the kinds of employees who are, uh, who are going to work for that company. In other words, they're making decisions about where they're going to locate and what their buildings are going to look like, primarily based upon where their employees are telling them they want to work because they really want to capture that next group of, of young people. So I think part of the challenge for us here is, how do we create a place that has that sort of, that continues to have that sort of direction where young people are, but still emphasize the fact that early on in the process, we want to try and build commercial space if, if possible. And uh, so I'd say that's, that's one challenge I would focus on. It's pretty easy to walk in here and say, because of the strength of this community, it's easy to say, we could build a 200 or 250 unit apartment building. That's pretty easy to do. But if you're looking for somebody to, to come in here and very quickly try and jam down um, your throat of uh, But if you're looking for somebody to, to come in here and very quickly try and jam down um, your throat of a uh, 200 or 250 unit apartment building and not pay attention to some of these other things, that's not us. We, we want to try and pay attention to some of these other goals. And to me, that's the challenge. <coughs> Thank you. Is, is there anyone from Redgate? Uh, um, or the first team that wants to... Oh, sure. Thank you. I think that's a great question. And, you know, I think in terms of the, the ground plan, the public realm, we feel very confident about that. I think with Jesse's help and the team. And I think, you know, we're, we didn't spend a lot of time on it, but we're very excited about the market. We see the changes that are happening um, and the just the sort of... Um, Flight to coolness and the flight to uh, to value and, and that sort of thing that I think will and the growth in the Boston region generally and that will make Union Square a very desirable place to be. But I do think that the biggest challenge is going to be related to infrastructure and some of the big infrastructure moves that we don't control. So 
you know, when we think about public realm, we think about it in terms of not just the, the ground floor and the properties that we have direct control over, but also, you know, the entire area. And we don't control all of that. And, and I think that, you know, once the community comes to a plan and we have a development plan, it's going to be clear what kind of infrastructure improvements, whether they be transportation related or, you know, sewer related, whatever it might be, you know, parks, et cetera, that others will say, yes, we'll do that or, or but, but that the time frame isn't on the time frame that we need it to be. And so I think, you know, we've, we've done that before. We figured out how to get projects funded. Um, Dan O'Connell is on our team and he is a master at that. He used to uh, work, at, work for the state. He was the um, executive, um, ex um, executive secretary for economic development. So he knows how to get that stuff done. But, but I do think that, you know, not controlling some of those bigger picture issues is our, would be our biggest challenge. Great, thanks. I just thought I'd go backwards. Um, I, I agree. I think that's a very good question. Um, I think for our team, the challenge that we see is sort of twofold. Uh, one is uh, acknowledging all of the work, the planning work that has been done to date. Um, but even with all of that work, uh, there are some uh, dis differences in sort of opinion of what Summerville or Union Square, excuse me, uh, should become. Uh, so a challenge will be to work uh, to try to find some consensus, some vision that um, you know maybe not everyone loves, but no one hates, and that uh, finds that middle ground uh, that really works for Union Square. Uh, coupled with that is uh, sort of in the same vein of finding a balance, right? I mean, uh, we've heard about. Um, developments that have large institutional investors, but we need to balance that with opportunities for independent retailers. Um, we've heard about developments that, um, you know, uh, drop in 400, 500 units of housing uh, at market rate levels, but we need to balance that with affordable opportunities for folks that um, currently live and work in Union Square. Uh, so I think it's that consensus building and finding a balance in that ultimate vision. Uh, that's going to be the challenge, but it really is the opportunity as well. Um, answering those questions and solving that puzzle is going to lead to uh, a really dynamic, interesting, uh, and successful project. Thank you. Um, any other questions, either for, for any of the specific teams or for all the teams? Okay, I think we're, we're good. Um, we want to thank Ed and Amanda uh, for doing all the work. <laughs>
p.m. for those folks who are interested, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the meeting, the Somerville Redevelopment Authority, which has issued the RFQ and will vote on the RFQ, is also holding another round of public meetings, I'm sorry, of public hearings. They will be held on the 10th, the 11th, and the 13th of next month. They'll all be from 4 to 6 p.m. The first one on Monday night will be in the Alderman's Chambers. The one on Tuesday night will be in the Public Safety uh, Building, and the one on Thursday night will be in the VNA on uh, Wall Street. So we want to encourage their interest, your participation, and with that, thank you for coming out this evening. Thank you. And right.